So my name is Elisa, and I was one of the first business hires at Mixpanel, the first business hire, uh, which means I have the dubious honor of saying I worked back at Mixpanel when we were a fourth floor walk-up, and it was me and nine dudes and a co-ed bathroom. Uh, so I definitely have some, some battle scars to show, and I think uh, some familiar faces in this room, some of you guys are in that office as well, um, visiting us at times. Um, in all seriousness, the coolest part about having been at Mixpanel for the last couple of years is I've had the pleasure of working with lots of different companies across lots of different industries on web and mobile and cross-device and wearables, across e-commerce and gaming and social and dating. Uh, and, and what's really interesting is I've been able to see a lot of the differences between how different platforms and industries approach analytics. Uh, so we've heard today that it's not all just one equal benchmark we can apply across the board. As we heard from Sean Denis, it's really important to make sure that you're looking at metrics relevant to you. So today I'm gonna to focus on metrics specifically for mobile. So how many of you have a mobile app or thinking of building a mobile app? Great, good portion of you. Uh, so mobile is a different animal. Mobile and web are not created equal. And there's a number of ways that we can dig into this, but I'm gonna focus on a few key uh, metrics or areas of importance in mobile. So first and foremost is the sign-up flow. We've uh, heard a lot today about the sign-up process and onboarding. In mobile, the sign-up process is your landing page. It is the first experience a user has. And we'll kind of dig into that and what best, best practices around that are. Um, secondly, you have the invitation flow. Again, something we've heard a lot about today. The invitation process is really difficult on mobile. We have the, the, the opaque walls of the App Store. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, talk about A-B testing, I've heard a lot about A-B testing. Um, so hopefully not beating a dead horse on that one, but a little bit around A-B testing on mobile. And then finally, again, a reten uh, metric you've heard a lot today is retention and, and how and why reten retention is different on mobile. So it, it turns out it's more important and it's easier to measure, which is great. So first off, let's dig into the sign-up process. So this sign-up process, this, this sign-up page essentially is your welcome page, your landing page in mobile. Um, and it's, it's rather unique. On web, we usually ask people to do a few things. On Pinterest, you might look at a few pins before you're forced to sign up. On mobile, it tends to be the very first experience. And for whatever reason, users have accepted that fact. Uh, and maybe it's when we download an app, we say, well, we're putting this thing on our phone in our pocket. It's on my device. Maybe I'm already giving them access to contact me with push. Why not give them access to my email address and my name and my gender as well? Uh, who knows why, but people, we definitely see a lower drop off in sign up on, on mobile versus web. So this is your first experience, which means A, you gotta keep it really simple. Uh, I think earlier we heard the metaphor of this, you know, you're about to go up a mountain, you can't see it, you're behind a cloud. So you're getting users trust here that you're gonna make this a simple, easy process. Um, secondly, it means that it should happen immediately. Why not? Why waste any time doing other things? Just get them to authenticate because you know they will. Um, and then finally, I'm a big proponent of social auth. Uh, and I know this is somewhat controversial. Um, you know, I've certainly heard arguments that, well, if this is your landing page, you're turning over your branding to Facebook. Um, and I, certainly uh, any marketers in this room will probably um, want to own their branding, and, I, and I, that makes total sense. On the other hand, when you use social auth, you get data. Uh, you get gender, you get age, and, and this is sort of a, obviously a fake, uh, a fake app permissioning step, but you might say, uh, we, you know, Facebook requests permission for your gender and your age and your relationship status and your likes and your friends, and people are so used to seeing this that most of the time they just click through, and now you have all that precious data. So what can you do with that? Why does that matter? Well, uh, there's a number of things you can do with data. First of all, you can target your users. Uh, seems like a no-brainer, but if you can target them based on who they are and their preferences, that gives you a lot of power around bringing users back via email, push, and app, offers, surveys. You can change the entire in-app experience if you want to. Um, so this is a company called Pixlr. Um, they are a photo editing tool um, owned by Autodesk. And using Facebook Auth, they discovered that 65% of their users, or 60% of their users are female, and 65% are between the ages of 13 and 17. So they said, okay, this is you know interesting demographic. What appeals to these users? And they did a lot of research, and they discovered there's a, a makeup brand called Illamasqua. Probably most of you guys in the audience haven't heard of that. Uh, it, it turns out it's a British cosmetics brand with a cult-like following. 
So they decided to run a campaign, and a campaign for them is basically customizing the, the editing tools available and the, and the entire experience, the entire flow. Um, and they customized it, they ran this Illamasqua campaign, and it, it was very successful for them. And it, it did a couple of things. First of all, it generated ad dollars. And secondly, it not only, it didn't bother their users, and I think a lot of us are terrified of putting ads in our, in our app, but uh, it actually made their users feel more connected to the app because it was a brand they really identified with. And this is something that got purely from the Facebook auth data. Uh, I think the quote from the Pixlr guy was, Facebook told us it was true, so it must be true. Um, whether or not you want to believe that is up to you. Um, so, you know, doing the social app gives you a lot of power over re-engaging your users, getting, that, uh, getting those retention numbers up. So the next step after you have your users signed up is to ask them to send out invites. Uh, and um, how many of you guys use Venmo? All right, about half the room. So they've clearly done a really good job at the virality part. They've really done a really good job of getting people using their app. And it, it wasn't always that easy for them. They had to focus really hard on this. So what they noticed first and foremost is that users who were invited to Venmo had a 20% higher chance of making it through the sign-up funnel. 20%. That's gigantic. Um, so they said, okay, great, let's just have every user invite as many people as possible. Let's just encourage everyone to send out hundreds of invites and incentivize them to do so. Well, they found there was actually a pretty strong correlation between number of invites sent and quality of invites. So for every invite a user sent out, the odds that that user converted went down. And this makes sense. If you send out two invitations, you're probably going to invite your girlfriend and your best friend. If you in have 100 invites, you're going to send everyone in your network and they're probably going to ignore these invites. So they sort of found, okay, our sweet spot is right around two or three invites, probably not coincidental that uh, Dropbox came up with that as well. Um, and so then they started offering incentives. So, you know, I don't know, you guys might have seen, they ran this $5 incentive for a while, invite two friends and get $5 in your Venmo account. Uh, so they started to, to optimize around that, that golden number of, of two invites. So you guys might be asking, well, you, you send an invite, it's really hard to measure. Um, there are plenty of tools out there to help you measure it. I know uh, the App Store, the iOS Store tries to hide this data from you. You can get around it. There are plenty of tools out there to help you get around this and track the invitation funnel. And you can even customize the entire experience for invited users versus non-invited users. So uh, sticking with the theme of Venmo for another moment, um, something interesting they do, you guys have probably noticed, when you open up Venmo, you get this social proof. You see an activity feed of all the payments your friends are making. Now, using Venmo today, this seems like an obvious, great, cool feature. Back when the day when they first rolled this out, they thought this is gonna be really creepy. Um, who wants to see, who wants to show the world their payments? Uh, they thought, you know, there were a lot of people internally at Venmo that thought it was a really terrible idea. Uh, so they decided to split test it, and guess what? it boosted signups by 20%, the golden number at Venmo. Um, so they, uh, they, they ended up deploying this broadly, and now this is the Venmo we know and love. It wouldn't be the same without it. You get that social proof immediately, which we've heard today social proof is, is usually a no-brainer, uh, but around payments, maybe not so much. Um, turned out it worked, and that's something they wouldn't have known if they hadn't split tested it. Um, so A-B testing. Uh, so one of the companies I work with is a bit of an extreme on this. It's called Duolingo. A uh, really interesting company. Essentially what they do is they offer free translation, or sorry, free uh, language learning services, and essentially what their users are doing are translating web copy, and that's how they make money. So really interesting monetization model, and they're extremely data-driven, extremely scientific, and uh, they're typically at any given time running about 13 A-B tests, which does sound like a lot to manage, and, and they maybe take this to an extreme, but running all these A-B tests and really obsessing over retention they've managed to increase their one-day retention. Uh, they've managed to double that. So here's an example of a split test they ran. So um, they have a tutorial. This is part of their sort of onboarding. You pick your language, and let's say, for example, you pick Spanish, and then you have to identify which one of these is um, the man in Spanish. So pretty, not a very difficult test. A pretty easy softball question to sort of help you build up your confidence and start learning. Um, so initially, when they ran this, they started, you got three little hearts um, on the upper left. And they noticed people weren't making it through, which really shocked them. Every time you got a question wrong, you lose a heart. And they were stunned to find people were actually failing this test. Um, and they said, well, OK, I guess maybe should we should we get a, give another heart. So they added a heart, and they now have four hearts. And they found suddenly their conversion rate skyrocketed. And they were, great, maybe we should add five hearts. Maybe that'll you know get more people all the way through. So they added five. And it turned out their conversion rate plummeted. 
And maybe I think people just thought it was too easy at that point. They didn't take it seriously. Who knows? Um, for whatever reason, four hearts seemed to be the sweet spot. So using that split test, they figured out exactly the right number of hearts to get people through that, uh, that tutorial. So a lot of people will say, well, A-B testing is really not for me. You know, we, we prefer to talk directly to our users. We prefer to get that qualitative research, do surveys. And that's great. Um, as I, we said earlier, uh, you know, sometimes your users don't necessarily know what's best for them, or I think the way she put it is, uh, it's a great way to get hypotheses to test. So talk to your users, get hypotheses, and then test them. Use data to figure out actually what does work and what doesn't, because your users don't always know. So it is hard, it, you know, on mobile you need to do it server side, you need to do it from your back end. Um, what I can say is there's a lot of uh, disruption in the space, there's a lot of interesting products being built. I think it's a, a really interesting space to keep your eye on. Someone earlier asked what is a, you know, a non-technical marketer to do. I think we'll see more and more innovation in the space that allows non-technical people to run split tests even on mobile uh, on the fly. So the last thing I want to talk about is retention. And we've heard retention used over and over again today, which actually makes me really happy. Because um, retention uh, at, at Mixpanel is uh, sort of our holy grail. Um, you know, we've, Jean-Denis earlier said, I don't really believe in, you know, MAU. And that to me is awesome to hear because our, our motto at Mixpanel is, you know, MAU is a bullshit metric. Um, what you really should focus on is retention, is how many people are coming back again and again and again. Now, Fred Wilson a couple years ago said that the, the, the benchmark for retention is this 30-10-10 rule, which essentially says, you know, 30% of the people that download the app will use it in a given month, 10% of those users will use it daily, and 10% of those users will use it at any given moment. Now, that was a couple years ago, and we've come a long way since then. So we were interested to see, well, does this rule still apply? So we ran a bunch of tests across our billions of data points across all different industries, and we were curious to see whether 30% was still the benchmark, uh, and whether or not this varied across industry. Well, it turns out it varies a lot, and 30 really isn't a, sort of a blanket or umbrella number that you can use. So unsurprisingly, messaging, social have really high engagement rates. And this makes sense. You know, you're getting alerted that you're getting new messaging, you're engaging with people, and then tools, e-commerce, travel, had lower retention rates. Uh, again, you're not booking flights every day, you're not purchasing something every day. So it's, it's somewhat um, intuitive. What was interesting is that we found is that any app that had a social off had a 6% higher retention rate, uh, which was not obvious to us. So an easy way to make your app stickier and get people coming back over and over again is to add a social layer to it, whether that's social proof, whether that is messaging, whether that is simply social off and getting data about the users. Um, so lesson here is don't just pick a random number of 30%. Figure out for your industry what works. Maybe if you're in dating or messaging or social, you're going to have a much higher bar. The good news is if you're in media, if you're running a news app, your bar is much lower. It also means retention's a lot harder. So uh, some, some more good news about retention on, on mobile is that it's actually really easy to measure because in mobile you have this great concept of an app version, which means you have this very controlled experiment. On web, it's really tricky because you could be running multiple tests at any given time. It's really difficult to break your users into manageable cohorts. Uh, mobile does this automatically. You have your version. So it's really easy to say, well, in version 2.0, you know, to version 2.2, did my retention rates go up? And you have a nicely built-in cohort. Um, so that's at least some good news, even though retention is really hard and really important. It's really easy to measure, and there's no reason not to. Um, so how do you get retention up? What can you do? Uh, sure, it's, it's great to hear me say, here's your benchmark and here's what you have to do, but how do you actually do it? Um, one trick on mobile is that you have push notifications, and these are really powerful. Uh, it's a really easy way to engage with users. So Firefly is an example. They're a, they're a dating app. And they found, they, they basically decided to try out push notifications for the first time. And we ran this experiment with them. And basically, they targeted, they, they split their user groups into two. And they said, we're going to just send push notifications to one user group and see if that makes any impact. And we were all really astonished to find that sending push notifications had a 20% increase in getting uh, those users back to the app a day later. Um, so I, I, I'm a big proponent of push notifications. I think certainly don't want to overuse them because you are causing people to get notifications at all hours of the day and their phone's buzzing. But used carefully and targeted with, again, that, that social data, uh, they can be extraordinarily effective. So uh, just one last, not to uh, belabor the point, but one last 
message on why retention matters so much. Uh, you hear a lot of people focusing on acquisition, on activation, super important. But if you are, you know, we have App A and App B here. They both start with 100,000 users. They're both, you know, doing a similar job of activation and acquisition. And one app has 5% higher retention in month one. Well, co compounded over six months, suddenly that app has 15% more users. Uh, so, you know, to win in a competitive market, retention matters heavily. So, in summary, the sign up funnel is something that you should obsess over. It should be simple, it should be streamlined, and hopefully it should be social. Uh, you, should, you should get as much data from it as possible, as, as simply or as, with one click as possible. Uh, continue to test, constantly test. Make this part of your company's DNA. Run split test, experiment. Uh, look at the metrics, look at the data. And don't just go by uh, you know, qualitative input. And then finally, uh, keep your, your eyes on retention as you push out new versions. Uh, it's really easy to, to take a look at these cohorts and just make sure over time that you're doing the right thing. Uh, so now is my little shameless plug. We're hiring. We're here in San Francisco. Uh, so if you have any questions on metrics or on Mixpanel, I'm happy to answer them. So feel free to, to get in touch with me. Thank you.